Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to MedSynapse, the podcast that brings you the brightest minds in the medical world. Today, we have the pleasure of introducing you our distinguished guest, Dr. Ahmed Hafiz Musa, an incoming neurosurgery resident at Mohammed bin Rashid University in Dubai. With an excellent academic background from Batterji Medical College in Jeddah, where he received honors, Dr. Ahmed has made an impressive mark as a profilic researcher. With over 30 publications during his medical school years, including a notable chapter, Contribution in the Impact of AI on Healthcare, published by Elsevier, Dr. Ahmed's dedication to research is exceptional. Dr. Ahmed guided more than 50 students through competitive research papers, presenting at various local and international conferences. Beyond his academic achievements, Dr. Ahmed is an active member of the prestigious European Association of Neurosurgeons and the American College of Surgeons, further solidifying his place as a key player in the medical community. Welcome, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Nigar, for having me on board and thank you for the lovely intro. The topic for today will be Medical Research for Doctors, a Beginner's Guide to Success. Let's dive right in. Imagine I'm a complete beginner in medical research, feeling overwhelmed and unsure of where to start. What advice would you give to someone in that position? Okay, so uh, first of all, um, I assume like the, the purpose of the question is how can you get started when you want to initiate a research? So it That's... depends on what level of training are you in now. If you're a junior student, a senior student, an intern, a resident, or even a senior physician. Might sound a bit surprising, but some senior physicians, uh, especially some of the older generation senior physicians back then, Research wasn't much uh, of a common thing to do alongside clinical practice. So now it's becoming more common, definitely. But like in terms of starting points, if you're someone who's still early in their med school career as a junior medical student in your preclinical years, uh, what I advise you is to uh, seek opportunities without having specific filters. You know, like like say yes to whatever opportunity knocks on the door. Um, do not be selective in the types of projects you get in. Uh, ask your professors, email everyone you encounter from like those who teach you on campus, those who teach you in the lab, those who teach you like uh, those who teach you outside school even like just email people and, and whatever comes in, just take it in. Like for example, some people are going to have case reports, some are going to have uh, review articles, uh, some are, especially in preclinical years, some are going to have lab based studies. So say yes to whatever comes on board because only through practicing you're going to actually learn how to do research yes the theoretical uh, part is important however in my personal opinion especially when it comes to academic and clinical research you only learn by actually doing by trial and error now if you're someone who's a bit more senior in their medical school years like someone in the clinical years or approaching intern year if you happen to uh, develop uh, like a speciality of interest uh, then yes, start narrowing down your research to towards that field. However, still, what I'd say, from first year of med school up to the end of intern year, always be open to whatever opportunity comes. Like whatever knocks, like knock as many doors as you can, and whatever door opens, just go in. Don't say no. Don't be highly selective. Don't be like don't don't have specific criteria, especially as as a student. Now, the more you approach your senior years towards intern year, by default, you're going to start developing in one way or another uh, some interest. So if we're talking about med school specifically, like it's either going to be a surgical interest or a non-surgical interest, for example. If you know you're down the surgical path, makes sense you want to approach more surgery doctors. If you're down the uh, non-surgical path of like internal medicine or psychiatry or non non-interventional uh, specialities, makes sense that you're going to approach these doctors more often. However, while still keeping in mind that if different opportunities come in, do take them. Because what's expected from you as an applicant to residency is how much is, is not like necessarily like the amount of research you've done in the specific field. Yes, of course, it's good to have research in your field. However, research uh, as looked to by the program directors is a sign of attitude and a sign of commitment. Uh, 
what when they see that you have finished let's say 10 publications it shows that 10 times at least you started a project and you finished it and you published it so while yes doing research in your specific field is important however uh, as a resident uh, as a residency applicant it's a sign of commitment to the program directors then second thing comes into the topics that you've published if they're relevant to your field or not so and if you're someone who's actually a resident or like a specialist fellow attending now obviously it makes sense only then you're going to focus your research on areas of your speciality if you're a neurosurgery resident obviously you're going to do neurosurgery research you're a psychiatry resident you're going to do psychiatry research so yes only then it makes sense and as you step up in your career makes sense you're going to be more stuff specialized like for example a spine surgeon is going to have research focused on spine but like let's say a neurosurgery resident may have more broad research than if he does or she does a skull-based fellowship then research is going to be focused in that area you know and the same thing we said like in med school from junior to senior your research starts broad then gradually narrows same thing happens in residency your research starts broad with all the stuff specialists of your field and then as you approach the end of the training, it, it narrows down to like what fellowship or what subspeciality you're going to go into. So that's in terms of how to approach it from a mindset prospect. From an actual, like, uh, I can say hands-on prospect, the simplest thing is basically email. Send emails to everyone, you know. The way I started, I sent emails to almost every faculty member we had, like 50 plus emails, and like only one or two people or three people max replied. And those three replies are what you take in mind and work on. And then with time, you're going to like people are going to know about you more. So send emails right now, send emails to people, you know, and at least someone's going to get back to you. Now, writing can be a very difficult block for some doctors, but research participation should still be accessible to all. How can doctors who may not consider themselves strong writers contribute effectively to medical research? Okay, so uh, firstly, uh, you cannot deny the fact that writing is an inevitable skill. You're gonna have to, uh, you're gonna have to acquire during your, uh, like, during your career as becoming a researcher. Now, obviously, if you're someone who's just starting up with the first project, you may not be asked for much writing. Uh, instead, you may contribute through data collection. You may contribute to more field work. So, if let's say the study is based on extracting data from a hospital database. Maybe you're going to be the one who's extracting the data onto an Excel sheet and coding them. And then the people who are a bit more senior are going to do the writing part. Uh, if it's a field-based survey, maybe you're the one who's going to be distributing the fields. If it's a systematic review, for example, you're going to be the one extracting the articles. So there are some contributions which are, like we can say, not directly writing, but like, because, you know, writing is, is like, how do I say this? It's, it's, it's the last part in the research. So... Yes, we do write a proposal in the beginning to get the approval and everything, but like eventually writing the manuscript only comes after we've, we've created our questionnaire, we've collected our data, we've surveyed our people, we analyzed the data, only then comes the writing part. So there is a lot much uh, contribution that can be done other than writing. Now, if you're asking how can someone improve their writing skills, what I personally say the simplest way is see how other people did it, do the same thing, and then gradually you're going to develop your own uh, your own skills and by doing the same thing i obviously do not mean like uh, plagiarism or copy pasting but i mean follow the the trends follow the uh, follow the themes you know like i like to look at it as themes so like if someone does paragraph one talking about prevalence paragraph two talking about this paragraph you're talking about that gradually copy their theme and try to rewrite it in your own way with time you're going to have your own way of doing things so to summarize see how other people did it initially try to do the same while put and with time your own touch your own uh, unique aspect to it is going to come in now apart Thank from you. writing what other essential skills should doctors develop to become more proficient in conducting a medical research okay so uh, first and foremost i'd say um, a good attitude while it may sound a bit irrelevant to the actual research but like a lot of research projects start and never finish because researchers come to a dead end in terms of not being able to communicate with one another. So in the same way that communication is important in the medical field between juniors, seniors, members of the same team and research, it's also vital that 
people have good attitude in order to communicate well with their own team. And it's also important that the team establishes a clear goal from the beginning and a clear, uh, I can say, sheet of, like they can put a sheet and write in it what they expect out of each person to contribute in the research. So uh, in summary, I can say it's good attitude. Moreover, I can say um, other than writing as well, you need to, it, it's a plus if you know some statistics because almost like all the uh, quantitative research comes with data analysis and statistics. So uh, it's a bit like, it's not common that you find medical students good at statistics. So if you're able to gradually start with the simple statistics and level up your, your, your analysis game, this is going to give you an extra edge over other students in order to understand the what, what does a p-value mean? What is a confidence interval? What is the standard deviation? All these terminologies, uh, some of the people which are like top, top physicians may not understand properly, but like what distinguishes a good physician from an outstanding physician is understanding the significance of the results they're deriving, you know? So I can say good attitude, always number one. And number two, uh, try to develop some skills in analysis and gradually understand what do the results mean. Very true, Dr. Ahmed. Now, research can be demanding, especially um, when combined with busy clinical schedules for practicing doctors. Now, sure. how can doctors stay motivated and committed to their research projects? Okay, so firstly, I'd say uh, ask yourself, like, also, this comes down, like, uh, I'll, I'll structure the answer in the same way I structured it for the first question. Where are you now at your practice? Are you a junior student, senior student, intern, senior resident, junior resident, or fellow and attending? Uh, first and foremost, you need to establish your priorities. Why are you doing this from the beginning? If you're a student, you know you're doing this in order to make your CV look good when applying for residency. Be honest with yourself. Uh, if you're a resident, okay, obviously it might be a requirement for a program, but like at this point, you're doing it to benefit the clinical society, benefit your, your own field, you know? If you're a fellow or attending, obviously you've been doing your specialty for a big amount of time and you've identified gaps in, in, in treatment, stuff which aren't still, like the cause isn't known for them or treatments which aren't identified. So you need to have a, a moral principle and some like, you know, responsibility towards your field that through research, you contribute to your field, you know, because through training, you receive training, you receive skills, you receive expertise. And I think research is one of the ways where you can give back to the medical community and give back to your field. Whatever your field is in medicine, all fields of medicine have unanswered questions and have unidentified causes, unidentified risk factors, unidentified treatments. So I personally believe in how I motivate myself when I do any research is I know like I've received a lot from medicine and I want to return back to the community, you know, because some treatments up to, to up to this date, some like I can say groundbreaking treatments, they've all arrived, they've all like came from research. COVID vaccines, how were they developed from research? So like research when done for the right reasons, it, it truly saves lives, you know? So just remember this in mind and have, 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 how do you say this? Like have a, have a clear goal towards what is your purpose for research? Maybe at the junior level as a student, yes, your research might not be that impactful to the community, but like, deep inside know that you're doing this for a reason you want to put a conclusion out there which nobody did before you know so try to be clear with yourself and why are you doing this if the reasons aren't good or aren't beneficial maybe just take a step back away re-clarify your intentions with research and come back in now support systems and resources are also vital for growth what resources and support systems are available to help doctors improve their research skills and stay updated in their field at the same time? Okay, so um, so firstly, like in order to stay updated, that's something. In order to find resources to do research, that's something. So let's start with the staying updated part. Now, obviously, uh, as I said, the more you advance in your years, the more focused you are. So in terms of staying updates, we have stuff like UpToDate, for example, a very well-known website, which people uh, like see, like, you know, like most of the updated guidelines and stuff go on there. Plus you have like well-known uh, medical magazines as Medscape, for instance. Um, um, also like the New England Journal of Medicine education section, they post like the most recent, uh, like, like high impact clinical trials. Um, and also, obviously, every field has its well-known journals. Like, for example, 
neurosurgery. There are a lot of like high impact journals as World Journal of Neurosurgery. Same thing goes in psychiatry, internal medicine, cardiology, like every field has its journals. And obviously what I advise is like, you want to read the journals with the highest impact factor. Cause like, what is an impact factor? It's like, it has, it has like a lot of ways of calculating it, but in the most simple terms, it's like how much impact as the name says, does this article, uh, how did this article contribute or have on the, on the medical community? How many times was it cited? How many times was it referenced by others? So I advise you obviously to get your information from like high impact journals and through that you get constantly updated with the with the latest publications in your, in your field. Now in terms of how do you acquire skills for research, uh, there are two ways of doing it. Either through a like mentor, finding a mentor, finding a course to join, like the ones I did personally, I mentored like over a hundred students in different platforms while collaborating and teaching students. But like another way to do it is that you can self teach yourself. And this is what I did. Like I personally, I never joined any courses. I just learned it myself and acquired the knowledge myself through the same thing that I said earlier, seeing how other people made it and trying to add my own touch, as they say, every, every time I do something. So like, I want to learn how to write an introduction. I see like 10 different introductions. You're going to find some patterns between them. So like, for example, the last sentence of an introduction always states the objectives of an article. So yes, the last sentence is going to differ from one paper to another, but like, I know the next time I'm going to write my introduction, the last sentence is going to talk about the significance of the paper or the objective. So like through stuff, like through observation, you're going to learn a lot, but like observe with, with while being self-aware that you're looking for themes, you're looking for similarities, you're looking for patterns, I can say. So look through patterns, look for patterns. Through this, you're going to learn a lot. Now, when it comes to mentorship, mentorship plays a significant role in guiding us on the research journey. What role does mentorship play in conducting meaningful medical research? Okay, good question. So firstly, uh, like let's define a mentor. Mentorship is definitely a very pivotal uh, thing when it comes to having a high impact research. A mentor is someone who is usually like at a professor level, who is, is someone who, who has done what like, who has practiced this for a very long amount of time, who has done a lot of research in their field, has seen a lot of cases, a lot of patients, and has enough experience to identify what are the gaps in the literature that have not been covered yet and need a lot of research to be done on. So like, let's say if you and I were to start to research now in a specific field, yes, through reading the papers, we can identify certain gaps in the literature. However, we will definitely need someone who has been doing this for like 10 plus years at least, who knows the insides out of what actually is not yet treatable, what needs more research on so, you know, it's like having someone who has an extra mile of vision compared to us. That That's an easy way to phrase it. If you can see like 10 steps ahead, a mentor can see 50, 60, 70, 80 steps ahead of you. So it's very important and it's, it's very essential to find a mentor early on. However, once again, back to the first question in terms of how can people start the research. When starting off, it's very hard to find a mentor. Uh, you'll be very lucky if you come across a good mentor in the beginning of your research career. Um, a lot of times you may find, you may be shocked that finding a mentor isn't as easy as it's phrased or as it's shown as social media. Like for me, only later in my stage just of research, like towards the end of med school, where I came across people whom, whom like, you know, I was able to, to benefit from their extra miles and extra vision when it comes to mentorship. But like, uh, finding a mentor is very, very hard. And in research, in research, it's even harder. So, um, Yes, like, how do I say this? Like, uh, you know, in research, there is what's known as a principal investigator. It's basically someone who, who's the most senior who leads the project. But like, not all principal investigators play the mentor role good enough. But as you advance through the years, as you get to do more research, as you stumble, as you like stumble across more people, you work with different environments, you're gonna be able to identify who's a good mentor and who's not a good mentor, who's a good principal investigator, who's not a good principal investigator, investigate, who contributes much to the research and who's just sitting around watching the teamwork, you know? So uh, the concept of having a mentor is important, but it should not stop you from beginning your research. And if you do happen to come across someone who isn't doing the 
role as a mentor properly and senior learn from them how what to not do so like I, that's the way i look at it if someone is a good mentor i want to learn how to be like them and if someone is not a good mentor i want to learn how to not be like them so in both ways there's something to learn out of it but like just be aware of the mentors you work with and hopefully you land across someone whom whom you both share common interests when it comes to research and certain topics now i would like to ask you one personal question speaking of impactful research could you share your own success story despite initial challenges with writing or the research skills that you had um sure sure so for me personally uh, like so i joined med school like in in, in the uh like in august 2016 and uh ever wow. since like ever since the end of high school i developed my interest in research particularly through my chemistry class in A levels where we had a lot of experiments a lot of you know like in chemistry the beauty of chemistry is that you get to know like like how do, how do things even how are things in the final shape you see and what like how what are the tiny molecules and particles that made up they make up everything you see around you so this was where my interest to research started developing and then when i joined med school Uh, earlier in my years in medicine like the med school I was in the concept of having students doing research wasn't very common and hence when I used to come up to certain doctors or email our research committee with my interest to actually conduct a research um like remember when I said I sent 50 plus emails like even in the earlier years I remember during the first two years of med school only one person replied back to me because it was very uncommon for someone to start research at that early phase of medicine but i kept trying i kept emailing i kept on like trying to approach and even there was a rule back then where i studied that you cannot start or submit your own proposal it was not a rule more of like you can say how things used to work like it wasn't common for someone to submit the research before third year of med school which is the end of of preclinical years however through trials emails contacting people trying to reach out to people showing enthusiasm showing interest uh going through multiple like like uh, how do i say this like before like before my first proposal was accepted like i i wrote over 10 research proposals with like different people and only after the 10th proposal the 11th one got accepted for the first time by the irb because like also i had no mentorship i had i had no guidance on how to do things but towards the end of second year of my school i came across one of my doctors who like sat me down we talked about like I talked to him about my idea he tried to enhance on my idea and make it more relevant clinically um I learned from him certain aspects of like how to do things do's and don'ts in research and stuff like that and then oh, this paper only like so like that's two years into med school and then this paper two years later so like towards the end of fourth year of med school was my first research publication so it's like took me four years to publish my first paper after 10 proposal rejections and then 11 phone got accepted and then this one I spent like over a year collecting the data then several months learning how to analyze and only then in the summer of fourth year of med school when I published my no summer of third year before fourth year began when I published my very first article and I still remember this article it wasn't anything crazy it was in a relatively It wasn't a good journal but like definitely like you know now my vision has changed with, with the new knowledge I acquired but I'm just saying that like when you look at how someone did something see how they did it for the first time you know because now with 30 plus publications when I publish my 31st 32nd 30 whatever uh, like the way I approach it definitely different than I did in my first year. but I'm still proud of how I did my first research so there's always a struggle which comes with it you know whether it was finding the, the doctor or the mentor who listened and then also like during fourth year when i published my first paper coincidentally we had a new dean of med school come in who was very enthusiastic about research as well and he has heard about me and this comes here comes the role of as i said like trying to show your work as much as can you're going to build a reputation to yourself he heard about me he heard about like how much i'm trying to do research and he sat me down and also he helped support some of my projects and thankfully ever since then like i can say the snowball effect happened where you know thankfully I, like i started getting like some of the people who used to not reply to my emails back then started emailing me then now to collaborate with them 
after they saw my work. So it wasn't an easy journey and, and there was literally no returns from it. Like not even, like even financially, I used to pay the publication fees for my own paper. So it's not like, it's like there were zero reasons to continue other than the fact that I was loving what I'm doing. You don't get paid for the research. You don't get paid for the time. You don't, you don't get paid for anything. Plus back then it wasn't even recognized properly, but thankfully through trials and errors and multiple attempts and multiple, I can, I don't want to say failures, but I can say multiple lessons. Only thankfully, like by the fourth year of med school, I started to build a reputa reputation within our med school for like my, my enthusiasm to research. I started being approached by doctors. So, and I, and this is where the part where I said yes to opportunity. I was approached by pediatricians. I was approached by surgeons. I was approached by psychiatrists, approached by people from different fields. And I said yes to everyone because I want to learn. And thankfully, like gradually, as I identified my interests, I started to narrow down my research uh, interests to the point where I thankfully matched to neurosurgery, where now I'm trying to focus my research on that. So it was a journey. And, and also like uh, a message to the people listening is that always, as I said, have a make the purpose clear, you know, make the purpose clear from why you're doing this. Because it is, it is a there, there's a lot of struggles which happen in the beginning of the journey, and you're gonna only be able to withstand them if your reasons are good enough to continue. You know, because it's too much time, it's too much effort, it's too much going to the hospitals in the middle of the week after a busy school day, it's too much money which goes in the publications. Like it's 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 very demanding, you know. So you're gonna only keep up with these demands if you truly love what you're doing. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Dr. Ahmed. That's a truly My inspiring pleasure. journey. Thank you so much. It's a motivation for everyone, for every beginner to not to give up, no matter how challenging it is. Definitely, definitely. There is light at the end of the tunnel always. Absolutely. Now, moving on to the next question. What are some strategies for doctors to communicate their research effectively to their colleagues, patients, and the broader medical community? Very, very good question. So uh, here comes the part of what I call self-branding in research. Usually the very first session of my uh, research courses, which I conduct whether in med school or like with outsiders, it's about how to self-brand yourself in research. So, uh, Basically now within an era where social media is probably the most used app in, in anyone's phone these days, whether it's Twitter, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Instagram. And I personally adapted this what I whenever I publish a paper, I share my, my outcomes from the paper on social media. Why am I sharing it? In order to open the doors to connect with people who have similar interests. So let's say you publish a research in surgery it is likely that at least one surgeon will come across your paper. He might repost it and then other surgeons who are following them might see them. One of them might coincidentally email you or DM you to collaborate with you on a new research paper and so on. And also LinkedIn. I forgot to mention LinkedIn. LinkedIn is one of the best places to share your research on. Um, especially that on LinkedIn, you can post the full PDFs of your article if you publish them in open access so people can will not just know that you published a paper, but they can even read the paper fully. So I'd say, uh, like with sharing it with colleagues and even patients, like our patients are on social media, you know? Um, so what I, I'd say a very smart thing to do is post your research outcomes on social media and post them effectively in which you share the key findings. I personally started doing this since my first paper. And to this day, whenever I publish a new paper, I share, I share it on social media with the intention that I, I share the knowledge of the new findings we gain. Use social media wisely and like put your work out there and eventually in one of your posts, you're gonna stumble across someone who may help you level up your research. Exactly, and, and who may just uh, love your work even though you're a beginner. True, and even nowadays when you look up someone, the first thing when you Google someone's name, like how do people know about people? Google their name. So it's going to be a good thing when you, someone Googles your name and they see your articles on PubMed, for example, or your articles online. So like self-promote and self-brand yourself. This is why usually when I start my research course, the very first session is I teach people the impact of showing your work. Like it may be very simple, but it truly has a lot of impact on you as a researcher as well. Now, moving on to the next question, 
How does engaging in medical research impact the way doctors approach patient care and decision making? Okay, good question. So uh, to put it simply, uh, we all know that in every specialty we have guidelines and how are guidelines identified through research? How do we know that when patient comes with this, we do that, and when the patient comes with the other thing, we do that thing is through research, through randomized controlled trials, through like basically clinical trials. This is where like most of the guidelines come. And how do we discover new medications through trials? And as we know, like in trials, we have four phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. Um, eventually through clinical trials is where we taste the safety and efficacy of medications, approaches, surgeries, even like, you know, like, like not just medications, but even like, uh, how do I say this, concepts of approaching care, things to do before operations, things to do after operations. Uh, through clinical trials is where most of the impact of, of medicine has been shown. And also another way is, is what's known as case reports. Now case reports are, are like, like they're, they're not the highest impact for researchers. However, they're very useful when encountering rare diseases, you know, especially when, when people encounter cases that are so unusual and they had a success story with them where like a certain medication worked, a certain dosage worked, and you write up this journey of the patient you had. And it's a single patient as a case report or a group of patients as a case series and you publish it. Also, like if you, let's say in another part of the world, encounter the same disease, look it up on Google and come across a case report or case series which shows how someone else, a colleague in another country successfully treated this disease, it's also going to help. So I can say like, this is how research has an impact on saving lives. You know, it's research. I feel it's like a formal way of sharing knowledge. Like I tried this drug with patient X and it worked. So when you look up on how to treat condition X, you're going to see my article and vice versa. This is on a, on the, of the rare disease spectrum. Now, of course, when it comes to other common stuff as diabetes or like all the common medications, we see new medications coming up every day or another. How do people identify these medications through clinical trials and through publishing them and sharing the, the results for the safety, for the efficacy, accuracy, adverse effect profiles, all that. How, is all that hap how, how has all that happened through research as well? What potential sure. career opportunities can arise for doctors who actively participate in impactful medical research? Okay, that's an interesting question. So a lot of opportunities, endless opportunities, but to be specific now, let's say uh, first, first and foremost, you're going to open a door in the world of academia. If you're someone who's like already an attending physician or someone who's like a fellow and like close to becoming a consultant, like being a researcher opens to you a lot of doors in academic employment and being and being like an associate assistant associate and ultimately a full professor at university so career wise you open a big door in academia universities uh like universities rankings are based on the research and how impactful the research is for people affiliated with them and universities are looking forward to affiliate people with them who do a lot of research because when you publish a research next to your name, it's written, whom are you affiliated with? So universities want to raise their rankings and how do they do so? Through people who do a lot of research. So this is definitely something that's like at a consultant recruitment level. If you're someone who's, let's say a resident or a medical student, or let's say you're a medical student looking to get into an academic residency program, obviously an academic research program is research based. And also they're more likely to recruit someone who's active in research, who's going to help raise the ranking of the university compared to other people who may not do so. So research is how you as, a, as an individual contribute to an institute uh, raising its ranking, you know? So that's one of the ways. And also it's a very common thing for people, let's say, who finish med school and go unmatched to pursue a post MD, post doctorate fellowship in their desired speciality. In one way or another, they do research and they help the institution. And in another way, they establish connections with people who might help them to get into residencies in the, in the next cycle. So these are like a few ways or a few examples of how research may help you outside like the regular paths of clinical medicine. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. I'm sure our audience has gained valuable perspectives on this essential aspect of our profession. Thank you so much, Dr. Nigar, for having me board and 
I hope the people listening do get some benefit out of this conversation. Absolutely, Dr. Ahmed. To all our listeners out there, remember that research can be a transformative journey, one that not only benefits the patients, but also enhances our own growth as compassionate healthcare providers. Before we conclude, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge our MedSynapse platform. MedSynapse is a leading platform that brings together the healthcare professionals, fostering collaboration and knowledge sharing. We encourage you to subscribe to MedSynapse to stay updated with their engaging discussions and gain access to a wealth of knowledge from experts in the medical community. That's it for today's podcast. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.